It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Ian Irwood, BSC, DDS, FAGD, FICOI, all the way from Ontario, Canada. He received honors majoring in biochemistry at the University of Toronto. He then received his DDS degree from the University of Western, located in London, Ontario. After graduating from dental school, uh, we both graduated in 1987. He and his wife, Dr. Teresa Bork, opened an office and a small center located in Unionville, Ontario, located just outside of Toronto. Having a special interest in orthodontics and dental implants, he took a part-time two-year orthodontic course, the Canadian Straight Wire and Functional Orthodontic Program, as Toronto was selected as the first brand-marked Noble BioCare training facility in North America. There was a lot of interest in oral plantology, and he pursued as much education as possible in that field. He is a founding member of the Toronto Implant Study Club and was the past president of the Ontario Study Club of Osseo Integration. He is currently president of the Canadian Straight Wire Study Club. After seven years in practice, Dr. Irwood and Dr. Burke relocated their practice to a health center in downtown Unionville and were in a cost-sharing relationship with another local dentist. When the dentist retired, Dr. Irwood and Burke brought in a third partner with a hybrid of the Lean and Mean Dental Office System, first presented by Dr. Rick Kirshner, but I have to give credit to his wife, Cindy Kirshner. I still, uh, <laughs> Dr. Irwood has lectured across North America on topics ranging from orthodontics, dental implants, practice management. He has a special interest in many dental implants. When not in the office, he enjoys spending time with his family, his three children, three grandchildren, and pursuing sports such as snowboarding, wake surfing, tennis, hydrofoil, kiteboarding. Oh my gosh. And, uh, my gosh, you're, you're, it's just like uh, we both graduated 87. Reading your resume and your website, it's like we're uh, the same brothers from a different mother. Uh, how are you doing? <laughs> Great, thanks, Howard. We're, we're actually uh, pretty close. One, one little thing, back in 1995, we'll go back in history here a little bit, both you and I received our fellowships That's at right. the Academy of General Dentistry in Baltimore. And, and I'm Irwood with an E and you're F with Varan and, and you were sitting right behind me at the, at the convocation. So that's, that's the first time we had met. And then a couple of years after that, you were lecturing in Toronto to a, a relatively small group at the Inn on the Park in uptown Toronto. And I attended the lecture. And at that time, we were just building our new office and I wanted to follow the, the lean and mean concept with Dr. Kirshner. And I was just designing the office. And I mentioned to you, oh, I had the blueprints in my car. And he said, well, you got the blueprints. You're having lunch with me. Let's take a look. So both <laughs> you and I had lunch together. We, we went over the outline of the, of the office. And, it, and I have to tell you, it's been quite, quite successful. And it was interesting, the design and, that we had put together, I had a classmate a, a year before that, he went out and hired a, a dental consulting team to design an office. He spent $30,000 just on the, on the plan, you know, regardless of the materials and everything else. And what uh, myself and our two partners, what we did was we contacted some dentists across southern Ontario uh, where we had heard that they had nice offices and we said would you mind if we had come in and take a look at your office and they're very proud of their offices so they invited us to their offices they allowed us to take a video camera in we videoed their their offices and then we took them out for dinner and said well now that your office has been running for a while what do you like and, uh, and if you could change something now what would you change so we got lots of great ideas from all these dentists and then sort of amalgamated it and put our office together. And, and that's, we, that's we, we also um, were online. You, you were both buddies with Ken Sirota and we were both Correct. early dental uh, internet users on his email group. Um, what was it called? Uh, Root ZX. Yeah, Root ZX. Yeah, I, I know Ken Sirota quite well. And before that, there was a... Um, an American who ran a who ran a dental forum as well. Dave Do Dave Dodell with the Internet Dental Forum. That was it. Yeah, we and, we met we were we met on that, and uh, my yes. gosh, uh, you probably at yeah. this point think I'm stalking you. 
Uh, <laughs> but uh, man, there's a lot, lot of, uh, lot of going on, a lot of change. Uh, those were uh, um, amazing years. So I don't even know where to start with you. There's so many things I could talk about. Uh, let's no, go. Um, let, let, let's start this dentistry and sensor. Let, let's go with the most uh, uh, controversial. Um, when general dentists start doing orthodontics. Um, right. You know, if they if they start doing root canals, the endodontist doesn't care. They start pulling yeah. a tooth, the oral surgeon doesn't call them. They work on a screaming kid, they're not going to get a call from a pediatric dentist. But my yes. God, you start doing the sacred ortho, the secrets yes. of the ortho temple. Uh, so right. I imagine if you're the um, if you're the president of the Canadian um, Straight Wire Association, what do you yes. have to? Uh, I mean, is that politically correct or not anymore? <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll tell you, the you, you need some background story. I know you had Sam uh, Dehars. Uh, his uh, podcast was on today, actually, and I was listening to it, Howard. But back in, back in dental school, I, had, I knew I had an interest in orthodontics I had a, as, as some other subjects. And our orthodontic training as a, a, through general dentistry, through our uh, dental school was very limited. And I can remember a couple of stories. One of our study sessions, we would be given these case studies and we'd be given a box with some models and a Panorex and a Ceph. And we, we'd be asked to diagnose the case and what we would do with it. And I bet one of my friends, you watch this, I'm going to I'm going to get a good mark on this. I didn't even open the box. And I I I said it'll be extract four bicuspids and we'll send it to the orthodontist and I got 10 out of 10 and I didn't even open the box. And so near the end when we were in, about to graduate a few months before we were going to graduate out of dental school, one of my classmates got up to the uh, to the, the, the dean of ortho and said, we'd like to learn some fixed bracketing. And he literally said, if you want to learn some fixed bracketing, we have, we have an ortho grad school here. You come back to the ortho grad school and you can learn some fixed bracketing. And that was his response. What I did at the beginning of fourth year in our grad school, in our ortho grad clinic, they didn't have assistance. And so I went up to the ortho grad students and said, hey, I'd love to be an assistant for you in my free, free time if that would be okay. And so it's, they said, that'd be great. So every free minute I had, I went up to the ortho grad clinic, I bought all their same textbooks and I started reading them. And so that gave me a bit of a, an ortho background before I graduated. Once I got out, I wanted to continue my orthodontic training I didn't, I didn't want to go back as a specialist. I love other aspects of dentistry as well. So I looked at some various programs. I, I narrowed it down to about, I think, three programs. And I talked to the instructors at each program. They were all offered in, offered in Canada at the time. And when I contacted the, one of the uh, instructors at the Canadian Straight Wire and Functional Orthodontic Program, he almost tried to talk me out of taking the course. He said, if you're not willing to do CEPHs on the cases, if you're not willing to work the cases up, um, if you're not willing to attend all the classes, don't bother taking this course. And I thought it was you know, interesting that he was almost discouraging me saying, if I wasn't gonna put in the effort, don't bother taking the course. We don't want your money, you know, just, so I thought this is the course for me. And so I took it and it really changed my course in dentistry, I think. To, still today, it's my benchmark in dentistry. It's taught by two general dentists who are passionate about uh, dentistry as a whole, not only orthodontics. And they really stress diagnostics. And they, they didn't teach you just one cookbook way of, of correcting something orthodontically. They would teach you three or four ways to handle it. And then you decide what's going to work best in your practice. And so they taught you how to think and then and then go ahead and. and uh, are you talking about and Alan McDonald and Robert Bond? I am. OK. Two great dentists. And I still keep in touch with them today. And after it was a two year program and we had we had tests after each session 
Um, and we formed an orthodontic study club, and, and that study club is still together to this day. So we've been together for about 29 years now. And so it's, uh, it's quite a thing. You know, you get to hear about the group members' kids and their grandkids, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good group. That is amazing. Um, so I, I want to move right into, uh, we, we just had a bunch of new graduates, and man, I can remember when Rick Kirshner started lecturing. Oh my gosh, that was, that, that guy, was, it was the most brutal lecture ever given in dentistry to this day. <laughs> he won't even come on my podcast. I mean, he, nope. just, he gets upset when he's lecturing, and yep. uh, my gosh, yes. and, he, and he doesn't like it when people disagree with him, but the bottom line is Rick Kirshner um, was a, uh, I don't know if it was an evolution or revolution, yes. his uh, Lean and Mean seminars uh, back in the 80s when he was the first one to realize yes. that overhead was going to go through the roof, and he exactly. knew what the drivers of overhead was. And he doesn't yes. care. Uh, but anyway, he now has 400 offices. Um, when he wants to um, see me, he sends his private jet to pick me up. <laughs> I uh, Seriously, I mean, I go, I, I mean, yeah. it's just no, crazy. It's great. <clears throat> and uh, I, I, so I, so what? what is Rick Kirshner, Rick and Cindy Kirshner, I'll even throw yes. in their two pug dogs. What, yes. what, 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 tell the young kids what Lean and Mean is. And I think it's so cute that being a Canadian, exactly. you started a Lean and Mary version. <laughs> yes, exactly. So we, I saw him in ni 1988. So I had just been out for about a year. Same year I saw and, him. Yeah. And I said, wow, he's he came up to Toronto and so did Cindy. And uh, it, it was just radically different from anything else I'd heard. And his story, basically, in a, in a Reader's Digest version, was he, he started an office just in, in the Denver area, and it was, was starting to become successful. He, he would bring in an associate, and then, you know, within a year, that associate, instead of joining or doing something, would, you know, move down the street. And I think that happened to him a couple of times, and then he said, there's got to be a better way. And so then he decided what he would do is, he would bring in an associate for six months, and if they were compatible, then they were going to become full partners. And he would sell half the practice to them. And so he would sell half the practice, and also they would share the patient base. It wasn't Dr. X's patients. It wasn't Dr. Y's patients. The, the, the doctor shared the patient base. And as the practice kept growing, then those two doctors would uh, sell a third of the practice to a, a new dentist. So they, they had a three dentist model, each owning a third, a third, and a third. And they would work in shifts for efficiency. There was no overlap because he, uh, Dr. Kirshner would say, if you have two dentists in there at, at the same time, you're, you're still not efficient. If you've got to expand the hours, make it efficient and, and get that overhead down, as you said. And he was successful at doing that. And, and so were we following his model. Um, I'll tell you, the, um, the thread on Dentaltown uh, that's called um, um, Lean and Mean, it, it's, it's one of the longest threads on Dentaltown. But when people sit there and say, uh, you know, their overhead is 65%, uh, when, when we got out of school, average overhead is 50%. Now it's 65 and 20% have 80% overhead. And they don't realize oh. that this was all addressed 32 years ago. And just go to oh. Dentaltown and type in lean and mean. And I mean, it's it just, um, I, I, and I think Rick argued with so many people for so many years, eventually got so yeah. rich, it just, he didn't. He didn't. Doesn't want to argue anymore. Yeah. He just doesn't yes. even care. But let, let's talk about the first things that the the, the uh, industry didn't get. Rick was the first one to tell everyone when your associate doesn't have any skin in the game, they don't care, and they're going to quit their job in five seconds. I mean, they just move around. So here it is, yep. three decades later, and these big DSOs. I I podcasted half the CEOs. If you own a hundred dental offices, you've been on the show. They say the problem yeah. is my associates. They only last a year or two, then they quit. Same thing in private sector. You don't go to yes. school eight, nine, 10, 12 years to be someone's employee. And Rick thinks the entire associate thing is just a wasted high overhead, and he only wants a partner. 
And um, yes. So. And, and you've got to be compatible, too. That was one of the things he stressed. You know, dentists, for the most part, are, are independent thinkers. You know, you, it's, sometimes it's hard to have two dentists, you know, being together. And I think it's tighter than a marriage, basically, if you ask me. But Why is that? Was, Why is that? I, I think maybe different philosophies and practice, different ways of handling the patients. In the lean and mean concept, you've got to find dentists that are compatible with each other. So if somebody sees, you know, a, a bridge there, the other person can't be saying, oh, it's, it's a partial denture. You know, if someone sees a big filling and says, oh, just leave it, and someone's saying, oh, no, that needs a crown, you've got to be on the same page and, you know, sending the same message to the patients. So, so you have three partners then, and one, one's your wife. I have two partners. Two partners and one you're yes. married to, right? Yes, yes. And then another partner. Now, so it, so you three people. What what are you averaging each? Like four six hour shifts covering. Yes. So the, right. So the way the way we run the office, Monday to Thursday, we have two shifts, two six hour shifts. We start at first shift comes in at seven thirty in the morning. They run straight six hour shift. They leave at one thirty in the afternoon. So what Second time? Shift. What time? Was Six a.m. Seven? No, seven thirty to one thirty. Seven. And then thirty. Thirty to one thirty. To one thirty. And then the second shift. Second shift comes in and starts at one thirty, and they finish at seven thirty at night. And we do that Monday to Thursday, and on Fridays and Saturdays we only run a morning shift, seven thirty to one thirty. The second shift is one thirty to. Uh, to what time? To 7.30. Seven. Right. And that's Monday through Thursday. Then Friday and Saturday, yeah. just a morning shift? Just a morning shift, 7.30 till 1.30. And, and we run three hygienists on each shift. How many operatories? We have six operatories, three for hygienists and, and three for doctor. Three DDS and three RDH? Yep. So you have, and so how many hours a week is the office open then? What what is that? Seven thirty to one thirty. So that's twelve yeah. hours. Twelve yeah. times four. Yeah. And then, um. So how many? What what's seven thirty one thirty? You're, yeah. You're looking. You're looking at twelve. You're looking at basically. Uh, 12 times five. So 60 hours a week of chair time. Like the office is open, running full blast. You, you said it's, um, well, Monday through Thursday, that'd be, that'd be that, eight six that, hour shifts. No, that's, that, that, no, that's, that's two. Well, yeah, that's, and then, and then another, another 12 hours with the Friday, Saturday. So you got 10 and then that's, that's six hours each shift. So that's 60 hours a week. 60 hours a week. Now, now dentists, they always, I always say dentists, are you patient centered? You know, is it about the patient or is it just doctor centered? And they always no, say, oh man, I'm, I'm yeah, totally yeah. dentist centric, dentist centered. Right. And then I say, yeah. well, what are your hours? Yeah. Monday through Thursday, eight to five. And I mean, it's like, it. it's like they say things. Um, and then eight and a half percent of emergency room visits are odontogenic in origin because no one's open. Yes. So you're open yes. 60 hours a week. So you're basically yes. doubling your availability to the market yes. compared to yes. the average dentist. And, and how and then that, and then you um, return on asset. If you build a dollar dental office and do one dollar a dentistry and make 10 percent, that's a 10 percent RA. But if you just have that same dental office and bring in another dentist to do another dollar a dentistry and they only net 10 percent. Now your return on asset is 20 percent. I mean, you you doubled yeah. your turn on the same asset. Why do you think yeah. this is not um, utilized in dentistry? I, I, I can't understand why. Like, like. People hear about the concept and they see our practice and they're basically overwhelmed. And, you know, I think there needs to be a new Kirshner out there explaining it to dentists because we, we are able to work less hours. I have more time off and 
we we have excellent excellent staff. The staff we'll get about talk about the staff. We have great patients that love the practice, and I, and and I earn more money. I take home more money, and I have I work less hours than most dentists overall. Well, what do you what do you think it is though? I mean, we we say we don't know, but what do you think it is? That more dentists aren't aren't using yeah. this concept. Yeah, I I think they don't have the. I don't know if you want to call it guts, but willingness to do it. I looked at Kirshner's concept and I just said, this makes so much sense. And, and I said, you know, when I go, when I do something, I study it and then I go all in. And I was lucky enough before we were opening uh, and using this concept, I would actually send some emails to Kirshner and he would email me back. And, you know, I was just amazed. And for it was just outstanding. And so some of the things in, in Unionville, which is basically a suburb of Toronto, rush hour is a problem getting around. And if we had open, if we had basic hours, say nine to five, our staff and our patients would be just stuck in rush hour, an hour just to get down the street, basically. It's ridiculous. But because we start at 730, our staff can get in just ahead of rush hour. Our, our patients who need to get in early, get out early, can get in there. And, and then that first group leaves. We have a, a turnover of doctor, hygienist, assistants, um, receptionists. At 1.30, there's a massive going in, going out clog. You know, for about five minutes, there's pandemonium. And then it all settles back down again. Um, and then that second group, they finish at they finish at one thirty, or sorry seven thirty, and they they go home in no rush hour traffic. They can get home, and we've still provided service for those patients that may need an evening appointment. So nobody can tell us, doctor, uh, I can't see you because your hours just don't you can't accommodate me. There's basically no one that can say that say that to us. And then the, the other thing with, with the lean and we call it, as I said, Kirshner calls it lean and mean, and we call it the lean and merry concept. We sort of Canadianized it a little bit. And Kirshner says, you know, if you do a hybrid of my concept and it doesn't work, don't blame me, which is fine. We've, we sort of made a hybrid of it a little bit, but it's, it worked and it is working. But some of the things with the, the, uh, concept. He has a whole dynamic on on patient patient psychology. Kirshner understands the way patients think, and that that was another thing that I picked up from him. So our our new patient exam, we'll have a patient come in, and we don't spend a lot of time on the phone with them gathering information. We just want to make sure they know where the office is and they can get there. We usually get them there maybe 15 minutes ahead of their appointment time because we know they've got forms to fill out and make sure they get to the, the office. Once they get there, they fill out the forms and the typical dental office will just, maybe the assistant will come in, take the patient back into an operatory, doctor might come in, may or may not start some treatment and, and that's how the patient new patient experience starts. With our practice, what we do is we have the dentist go out, greet the patient. I like to get, I like to personally shake the person's hand, and I start picking up vibes from the patient. Are the palms cold and sweaty? Are they nervous? Um, are they relaxed? And and we bring them into a consult room first, and I'll sit the patient down, and for the first five or ten minutes. I just want to know about their social history. I, I, I want to know, you know, what their, you know, if they have any hobbies or activities. And I ask that of the patients, do you have any hobbies or activities? And you find out all kinds of interesting things about, about patients and, and about their family. And we just get to sit and chit chat for five or 10 minutes. And I can see them relaxing in the, in the consult room, their shoulders are easing up and they just feel more accompanied and they start to, they start to like us as well. 
And then after that, I'll go through their medical history and dental history. And I want to find out, you know, did they last see a dentist two weeks ago and something went wrong and they're unhappy or they haven't seen a dentist for five years? I want to know what, what's been happening with them. So once we've got it, gathered all that information, I like to try and do the new dental uh, patient exam myself if I can. But if I'm too busy, then it goes to the hygienist. So if, if I do bring it to the hygienist, I introduce them to the hygienist. I make sure I say the patient's name a number of times and I say the hygienist's name a number of times to the patient so they remember who's who and they get comfortable with it. And the first thing that I do, I'll, I'll do a TMD exam on them. And then the first thing we look at when we go into their mouth is, is I'll say oral cancer check is negative. And that'll spark their ears up right away. And I know the patient's thinking, God, I saw my last dentist for 20 years, never said anything about cancer. And, and so I know from that point on, in the new patient exam, the patient's going to be listening to every word we say after that. So we'll, we'll do the dental charting and we put everything in plain English for the patient. It'll be a white filling, a silver filling, white crown. Um, and then we'll do a, a full six probing on each tooth periodontal exam. And instead of saying, oh, it's bleeding, we'll use terms like hemorrhage or pus. And, and so the patients start to get an idea of, of, hey, something's going on in my mouth here that, you know, I wasn't, I didn't really know about. After that, we'll do a a full intraoral camera exam. And you often ask doctors, you know, and for in, advice for, for new dentists, what would you buy? Would you buy an intraoral scanner first or what, what are you going to buy? Anyone opening up a new dental office, I think the first piece of technology you need to have is an intraoral camera. And, and everything else will fall into place after that because – Still to this day, I've had my intraoral camera, you know, 25 years, and the patients think it's the most modern thing out there. And you put a, a, a fractured cusp or something up on that TV screen, and for the patient, now it becomes real. You just can't be having them, you know, hold up a mirror and look at this over in, in the, you know, in the fourth quadrant. Can you see that little broken tooth there? You, I think you need your intraoral camera, first piece of technology you need to have in your office, and, and things will fall into place from there. So we do the intraoral camera exam, and I like the, the staff, if it's my hygienist doing the exam, I like them to leave something, a picture for the patient to remember. So it might be a bleeding gum, or it might be that fractured cusp up on the screen. I'll come back in the end. And I'll say to them, you know, the average, the average patient coming in for a new patient exam, I, I quiz dentists on this, but I ask them, you know, what's in the patient's mind? What do they think is going to happen? Well, in the patient's mind, the new patient's going to come in. They think they're going to get a little scale polish, a little pat on the shoulder and say, see in six months or nine months, whatever. But that's the last thing we do in our practice. So after we've done the intraoral camera exam, we may even get study models that day if I need them. Um, I'll say to Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Smith, um, I need a chance to look at your x-rays. And once we look at your x-rays, we'll get you back in. We'll go over the findings and then, and then we can start treatment. Would that be okay? 99% of the patients tell me that'll be fine. Let's do it. For the 1% that say, no, I came, I phoned up, I wanted a cleaning, I got to have a cleaning, I'll say to the Mrs. Smith, we normally don't start a cleaning on the first visit, we'll start a little bit here, and then we may need to continue at the next appointment. But that's one out of 100 patients that we get that response. And so we, we finish the intraoral exam, we bring the patient back to the front desk, and all I want to do at that point is... Book the new book a consult with the patient, and if they're a pretty standard case, they don't have any emergency situations. We'll book we'll book a, a visit with the hygiene, and then we don't ask them for any money at that point. 
we, we collect their insurance information, but we don't talk about money. So we've got the appointment booked, patient leaves. Still to this day, I send them a handwritten letter with in the post that goes out that day and I'll say, Mrs. Smith, just a note to thank you for choosing our dental office we, uh, for your continuing dental care. And I like to put the words continuing dental care. We look forward to seeing you at your next visit. So the patient goes home. I know the dental visit is the new patient exam is going to be one of the topics of conversation at the dinner table that night. So she'll be talking with her spouse and the, and the kids, and they'll say, well, you know, how was that new dental office? And they say, wow, they were, they were really good. They were very friendly. They didn't hurt me. And I got some things going on in my mouth I had no idea about. And so when the patient comes back, well, before the patient comes back, they get that letter in the mail, and they'll see our letterhead on it. So what do they think it is before they open it? We haven't, we haven't talked about money with them yet. They get our letterhead in the mail a couple of days later and they think, oh, here comes the bill. You know, they didn't, they didn't mention anything, but now, so they're opening it, anticipating getting the bill from us. Instead, they open it and they get a handwritten letter from me thanking them into the practice. And so I know the next visit I see them, they already have a feeling that they like the office, they like me, and they're more willing to accept treatment. You know, patients don't have to love you, but they have to like you before they're going to proceed with any treatment. And I present them a treatment plan with everything, basically. And I'll tell them, listen, you're, this is the total amount, and I don't break it down into... There's so much for perio, there's so much for fillings, there's so much for crowns. I give them one number. And then I'll, I might say, you know, we'll give you a 5% discount if you pay for everything up front today. And, and some of the patients, especially the ones who aren't on insurance, and they may have some money socked away, will we'll go ahead and pay for everything up front. And it does happen sometimes. The other thing that it allows me to do is, most patients are used to seeing the, the, the hygienist maybe once every six months, once a year. And if you start hygiene on that first visit and the hygienist turns around to you and says, this guy's got a lot of subgingival calculus. I'm going to need two or three visits. And then you go and, and say to him, listen, we've, we need you back for two or three hygiene visits. He's going to say, well, I only went every six months to my last dentist. Why do I have to come back two or three times? Who are you guys? So by not starting the hygiene, getting all your information first, then going back to them. And at the consult visit, I like to say, Mrs. Smith, the calculus builds up in layers. And you've got multiple layers here. And my hygienist is going to need three visits to clean that away. And we also like to involve the hygienists in the treatment plans so they'll put down how many visits and how much time they're going to need so that the hygienists have a, a sense of ownership with the patient as well. And that's part of our team philosophy. The dentists, um, I mean, they could just learn so much from me and lean. Um, I just think um, I think they don't want to have a partner. I mean, I mean, look at these DSOs. They don't yes. want to hear that um, their employees are going to quit every year or two because um, when you say, well, if you gave them stock and made them a uh, partner, well, they want all the yeah. stock. So so when Wall Street wants to own the whole company with one CEO that, you know, they're both billionaires, they, they want everybody to be employees. And what Rick and you are saying is that um, everyone has to have skin in the game. You got it. And... And by, and by the way, when you lecture, I know you lecture all over, uh, all over. Um, you always know who the owner dentist is because they're sitting in the first three rows looking right at you. You always know who the right. associate is because they're staring at their phone on Snapchat, Instagram. They never have a question. And if you walk up from behind them, you just, it's just on Facebook. So the, the person true. who has to pay the mortgage is taking notes and the employee is not taking notes. And that's another thing we've learned on uh, income inequality. Um, people who make 10 to $15 an hour 
are motivated by bonuses. If they were motivated by money, they wouldn't be making 10 to $15 an hour. Most uh, operators just, they, they want to just um, uh, put all the incentives on the store operator, the office manager, um, you know, the uh, the person in charge of this outback location right here. Yes. That one guy is going to drive the whole thing and splitting yes. up all of his money with the bartenders and all that stuff isn't, uh, doesn't plan out. I, I want to switch to a completely, this is dentistry and sure. censored. And I like to talk about what no one's going to agree with. Uh, you okay. and I were both um, um, honorees of uh, Dr. Charles English. I mean, uh, uh, English, yes. um, born 1946 to 2005. Yes. He was an implant prosthodontist. Um, who died early from cancer. I yes. think he was like 59 uh, or something like yes. that. But um, he liked many implants and you just can't yes. like many implants because uh, on Dental Town, we've only had to separate the herd two locations. Right. One's an implant, yes. so we had to sell it separate yes. mini implant from implant. The other one was in yes. CAD CAM. We had to um, separate all the Serona uh, people from the, um, the um, uh, what's the one, Plan Mecca out of Dallas, yes. uh, E4D, be, because yes. anytime any 4D guy would post a case, the Plan Mecca people have to get on and say, well, yes. you should have bought the other one. It's like, dude, we're past that. He owns an yes. E4D. Shut up, okay? Yes. Um, so, so many implants, so, they're so controversial. Yeah. Why would you, they are. why would That's you, still, what, do, what do you think of these controversial many implants and which one do you okay. like? So, so my, my background in history in that is that, as I said, Toronto was one of the first test centers or was the first test center for Branamark um, back, in, back in the, the 1980s. And so we were, well, we were fairly progressive at the University of Toronto. A lot of the research was going on for North America. And... I, I had an interest in, in implantology, again, right from when I was still in dental school, and we weren't getting any lectures at all. And I can remember our, our removable prosthodontic exam for complete upper dentures. Um, we had to design a case or something, and I designed it with six implants. And I'm sure I shocked the professors at that time, but I got a good mark on the exam, so I guess they thought it was okay. But when I first went out and wanted to learn about implantology, it was basically closed to specialists, oral surgeons, and, and maybe some prosthodontists to restore it. And for me to get into a course, I had to sign up, not say who I was, and sit at the back and just be quiet. And that's what I did for the first little while, and uh, started gaining some knowledge. And it was it was interesting. I, I joined the uh, Toronto Implant Study Club once it was formed, and my uh, my wife she actually got a, a case where a patient needed an implant. She had a, a, a an oral surgeon put it in, but she restored it before I had even started. And I said, okay, that that was the straw that broke the camel's back. If my wife's re you know restored an implant, I got to get moving, and I quickly restored some some in, uh, crowns on implants. And then I was fortunate enough to have a professor invite my father and I down to the University of Toronto to watch him place some implants. And we went down, we watched him place some implants. We both walked out of the operatory and said, that's, uh, that's all there is? And so we said, we can be doing this. So I, I found a, 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 an easy first case and upper right and left uh, missing first bicuspid. I placed one implant, my dad placed the other, they both were successful, and that's how I started my, my implant career. And I had been placing and restoring um, regular diameter implants for, for a little while, and then I was at an, um, an ICOI implant convention down in Florida, and it was a three-day convention, and I saw this M-Tech booth with these mini implants. And I, I went up and I looked at them, and I thought, this is kind of different from what I've been used to. And one of the guest speakers there was was Dr. Charles English, and he had he had he was like a a morning speaker. He had about 300 people in the lecture theater, 
was talking about different ways of, of uh, restoring implants and troubleshooting. That was one of his fortes. He was he because he was getting cases sent to him from all over the states and how to figure this out and what can we do? It's on a bad angle. There's not an angled abutment here, and he would figure it out somehow. But I had a couple of questions to ask him after the lecture, and there was about 50 people in the line waiting for him, and I was number 50th. So we got through the line. I was the last guy where the room's still dark. We're just standing there, and he goes, do you mind if we sit down? And I said, sure, Dr. English, let's sit down together. So he answered my questions, and I said to Dr. English, did you see that MTech mini implant booth out there and he goes yeah i've been looking at it he said if those things work they've really got something out there and uh, then i thought to myself well if dr english is interested in it i better go back and take another look so by the end of the convention i only i wasn't going to buy the full kit they had a they had a full kit special on at the convention i just bought a few of the parts and pieces and i, I brought it back it was designed for only dent lower denture stabilization at the time I did three cases right away, all extremely successful. It was, you know, and uh, but my training was basically a 10 minute video, you know, and that was that was it. But I soon realized I needed more of the parts and pieces. So I bought the rest of the kit, started using it, and I sort of kept it on the quiet. Didn't tell any of my other implant friends that I was using these mini things and just slowly had more and more success. And it finally came to a point where where MTech needed a, a speaker in, in Canada and they were broadening their horizon. So they asked me to, to do it. And that's where I started speaking about mini implants in Canada. And I was literally doing lectures coast to coast. And the, uh, one of the founders of the Toronto Implant Study Club as a periodontist, Dr. Murray Arlen. I don't know if you've had him on the on the podcast or not. Great periodontist, places a lot of uh, dental implants, and he would have a uh, with his study club. He would have a, a once a year a case night, and he phoned me up and he said, "Would you mind bringing some of your implant cases for the study study club?" And I said, "Well, I'd like to bring some mini implant cases," and he said, "Okay, bring some mini implant cases." So I brought two cases to the study club. One patient. Um, had four mini implants uh, stabilizing a complete lower denture, and I didn't prompt the patient to say anything, but he told the audience having these mini implants stable as lower denture, it was as good as having his own teeth. Of course it's not, but that was his perception. The other patient um, I had placed, she originally came to see me, she had a partial upper denture with her missing upper uh, incisors, laterals and centrals, and had the rest of her remaining teeth. And she hated this partial denture. And she was, she was tight on funds. And I said, listen, I think we can place four mini implants here and I can put on a fixed bridge. And she was over the moon about it. So I placed, placed four mini implants. I did it with a template. They were in the perfect position. And I, this was my very first fixed case. So this had to work. So I left it in an acrylic temporary bridge for about nine months. And then everything was stable. Everything was integrated. I removed it, put a porcelain fused to metal bridge in, and it's still in her mouth today. And it's going on like 18 years now. And so I, I gradually started using mini implants in, in more areas. But I think most dentists, where they get into trouble is that the mini implants are a small wonder, not a small miracle. And too many dentists try and use them in inappropriate places. They're, they're only designed where you can probably do immediate load and you've got to have decent bone. And in the maxilla, most of the time, you don't have decent bone, especially posterior maxilla. So you get dentists who purchase a kit, they do regular diameter implants, they find a case where posterior maxilla, patient doesn't want to do grafting for regular diameter implants, and then they say, oh, I've got these, this mini kit, I'm going to put these mini implants back there. They put the mini implants in, they all fail, it's, and it's not designed for that 
that area. And then they say, oh, those mini implants are garbage. I've got cases for stabilizing lower dentures going on 19, 20 years now. So you can't tell me that they're not successful, but you have to use them in the appropriate place. And so you really need to take a course that stresses that. There are also some dentists on the lecture circuit who will tell you they slice, dice, do Julian fries, and you can do anything anywhere with them. And I personally don't agree with that philosophy. I, I try and be fairly conservative with them. And so that's part of my success and, and part of my philosophy with mini dental implants. So they work, but you've got to use them in appropriate places and you should take courses that have that philosophy and, and then you're successful. So 3M, um, they closed down their um, MDI mini dental implant yes. and, it, and everybody was just, I mean, out of nowhere, they just closed it. Why do you think um, 3M closed down their mini implants? Yeah, my, and I don't know the exact inside story, but I was doing some presentations for 3M and they're a, 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 a shareholder stock trading company. They had a new person in charge of their prosthetic division and 3M, they know impression material, they know composites and, and things of that nature. And the mini implants were just a little bit too outside the box for them. And, and 3M sometimes is hesitant to make changes to things unless they're 100% comfortable with things. And they never truly got comfortable with the mini dental implants. So they didn't even sell their, sell their rights to it. They just, as you said, overnight, they just closed the whole thing down, which was unfortunate. And they also, when they purchased um, M-Tech, uh, originally M-Tech had, a, had a, um, a, an implant, we'll say, looked similar to an Astra implant. And it was very successful. I have lots of them placed. And 3M was going to utilize that as well. And they got a knock on the door from a, a legal company saying, no, another company is going to go after you if you bring this implant. I don't think the company cared when it was M-Tech, a little mom and pop shop. But, but once 3M was getting into the business, I think they got concerned. And so 3M backed off and never brought in the uh, regular diameter implant, which they had, you know, the possession of at the time. So what so, mini implant are you using today? So, so today there's, there's, there's a few of them. What, what happened was um, a, a company called Sterngold ERA Attachments. They produce a number of regular diameter implants. As, as soon as 3M... Uh, stop producing or announced they were going to stop producing the mini implants, Sterngold brought out a very, very similar implant that is compatible with all the M-Tech kits, that is compatible with all the, uh, with all the 3M kits. And within two years of bringing it out, they are the number one market seller in, in America with mini implants. In two years, they went from zero to number one. So, what do you think of the um, of the uh, Todd Shatkin uh, of Shatkin First Dental Implants in uh, yes. Amherst, New York? What do you What do you think of that mini implant? That's that's another. Yes, that that one works well, and again, it's very similar to the M Tech, very similar to the 3M and the Stern Gold. What, what, so, what do you think of uh, what? Do, but what do you think of Todd's uh, new business model? Yes, well. I think some of Todd's philosophies that they may work in his own practice and he's fairly aggressive in some of his treatment planning much more than I am. And so that, you know, for the average general dentist, just starting off in implantology, I would start off conservatively and, and build on that. But, but have you, have you heard about his, um, the, um, the mini dental implant center of America franchise, which now is up to, uh, 77 locations. I, I've just heard about it recently. 
Yeah, I'm in Phoenix, and they just opened yes. one in uh, Tucson. But the, what I think is the most interesting about it is the whole thing's based on these uh, these infomercials because uh, TV is plummeting. Basically, yes. there's basically no one on television um, under the age of 50. And yes. so you can buy three o'clock in the morning for a half an hour for ten twenty dollars and so they're doing all these telemarketing uh, deals and um i mean it's it's just it's basically it's a low cost alternative to clear clear choice clear choice right. is the clear choice it's a mercedes it's twenty five thousand yes. arch it's fifty thousand full mouth um and todd's doing it with many for half the price right and they're placing sure uh, even less yeah. So do you, uh, yes. do you think so, that's a, I mean, are you usually doing minis under removable or are you doing minis, uh, in mixed dentition? I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm doing them in both scenarios. You know, the, the, the standard is the complete lower denture stabilization. As long as you've got bone, bone there, you, you know, it, it, you've got extremely high success rate up in the 90 percentiles easily. Once you start varying from that, I do I do do some fixed with them, lateral incisors, lower incisors, because you have you have cases where sometimes like a three and a half millimeter diameter wide implant is too wide to go in a lower incisor region, and so are you going to you know do a Maryland bridge or are you going to cut down those teeth you know completely to do a full coverage bridge? I can I can place a mini implant there and still have my 1.5 millimeters of bone mesial distal to the adjacent teeth, put a crown on that, and and again I've got 10 years plus success with those cases, and so there are there is a place for them, but I don't I don't as I said I don't put them everywhere. I think we both have to be romantic right now and pay homage to uh, Charles English. Uh, why don't you? Yes. Uh, why don't you say something? Then? Yeah. So Charles English was a, was a mentor of mine. We actually became close close friends, and uh, he uh, he was he knew his literature. He knew his research papers inside and out. I would meet him at meetings, and he would start quizzing me. Have you read this paper? Have you read this paper? He knew his stuff cold, and he was a great person. He was always willing to answer your questions. And before he became ill, we were actually coordinating, starting to speak together because, again, he was a, a huge fan of the mini implants and he was a prosthodontist, you know, probably the most definitely in North America, you know, uh, the most experienced prosthodontist in the field of implantology um, and uh, a great, a great mentor of mine and, 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 a, and a close friend as well. I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and another another person, another prosthodontist that that is is a big advocate of mini implants is Gordon Christensen, right? And 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 if you go to any of Gordon's one day seminars where he covers A to Z in general dentistry, he spends about half an hour telling general dentists if you haven't incorporated mini implants into your practice, you're missing the boat, and he tells them that. And so it's interesting. The mini implant companies should be having seminars about four weeks behind Gordon Christensen's schedule as he goes across North America to, to follow up on it. Well, I just I just have to say something about uh, Charles, because uh, sure. um, the, the, the thing that I thought was just uh, so amazing is you got to remember that when we um, that when you started doing implants, they were extremely controversial. And so it's yes. not about minis or root form or that. I mean, back when we started, there were ramus frames or subperiosteals or yes. all these things. It, it was crazy. And the pano was the high tech radiograph. But yes. what I loved about Charles is the implant teachers of the time were just filled with who could do the biggest case and the most bone and, and the most this and the most that. And Charles had so much self-esteem he would only lecture on his cases that failed. And he yes. said, he said, when you when you do anything that works, you didn't learn a damn thing. And he would yes. sit up there and go through all these cases. Sometimes you're you would cringe. And uh and, and then he was so high self-esteem. And then um, and then the, it was probably the nicest uh fun time I ever had after a seminar. He was in uh 
that green laboratory in Heber Springs, yes, Arkansas. Little Rock, Little Rock, Arkansas. And back yeah. at the time, I don't know if it's still that way, but it was a dry county. So when okay. it, so when you said there were 50 dentists asking questions all over, I said, what are yes. you going to do now? And he says, I want to get yeah. a drink. And I said, it's a dry county. He goes, I know it's about an hour drive. I said, can I go with you uh, yes. to, to, on the liquor run? And we yeah. drove an hour and a half to go get all the uh, the uh, the liquor and uh, refreshments. But it was yeah. just so cool that he didn't have to show off anything. No. And he there was were... commanding the room because you could. Uh, and I'll give you another example. So who's the yeah. guy? Who wrote a good to great? Uh, good to great. Who's who's, oh, who's yeah, that guy? I've read that book. Yeah. So it was um, it's uh, who is that? It's the best Jim Collins. So yes. Jim Collins writes this. Um, you know, back when I was out of school, the first one was uh, built to last, and then it was yes. good to great. But you know where I learned the most was his smallest book, How the Mighty Fail. And Jim okay. even said in his deal, he says, okay, I've written three amazing books. I had to go from good to the greatest. But when I start, so I reversed it and I said, well, what, you know, what makes the mighty fail? And he said, there were less data points in that on how yes. the date on how they fail. But um, so, yeah, um, just uh, what, what an amazing man. I want to ask you uh, yeah. another couple of things. Sure. Um, a lot of these dentists, they just got out of school. They're $287,000 in student yes. loans on average. Uh, you and I met for the first time getting our fellowship in the AGD. Um, why do, do you think going back, do you think joining the AGD and getting your fellowship, was that a good idea? Totally. I, I signed up with the Academy of General Dentistry before I before I got out of dental school in my fourth year. And I like their philosophy of continuing education because I, I realized once I was in fourth year, you think you know everything, but you don't. And, and so I, 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 I joined up because I wanted I wanted to continue my education. And the other thing was I wanted to document my education as well. Because at the time, our licensing body, there was no criteria. You didn't have to go to two hours of continuing education to maintain your license in, in my neck of the woods. But I wanted some hardcore documentation. A and it was funny, a, a few years after I'd been in practice, they did a, a survey of dentists and they were just starting to formulate our licensing body on, on continuing education and hours, and they wanted to get an idea of what dentists, you know, what courses you were taking. And I think they sent out a survey with like three or four lines, list, list, the, list the courses you've been to in the last two or three years. And I could print out my AGD page with 500 hours on it. And I said, here, take this. And, and so that was, that were, that was two things that I thought about the AGD. One was I wanted to pursue continuing education, and the other was I wanted to document it as well. And I've been a member, of, you know, lifetime member basically, and and that was you know part of my incentive. What about yourself? I I, I think it was the, the the biggest game changer because number one, you know, here's uh, Phoenix with six thousand dentists in the state, and and I joined the I, I knew. All those guys had their FAGD and their MAGD. They were always great dentists, and they always made great money. And um, and then when I start digging into it, um, it just it just it just is. And um, but not only that, but it was the best networking. Like like another, yes. I'll give you another Charles English uh, course. He was great friends with uh, Carl Mish. And yep. uh, whenever I would go to, uh, I went to Carl's seven three day weekend thing one time. And um, and he was there. But I look back at that 30 years ago. I can't tell you how many legends I met at that seminar. We were all babies. Yes. So so right. so in dental school, you're hanging out with a bunch of people who like to drink and bitch and moan and complain. But you got skin in the game. You're a dentist now. You're a doc and you, you can't. You can't hang out with people who um, don't care about dentistry, and so right. it was. It was a, a very much networking, and that that's another thing that I um, um, 
see errors all the time when people are going to these great courses and they just fly out of the course, go right back to their yes. hotel room. And it's like, no, dude, it's not what you know. It's what you know and who you know. And you're going to yes. open up so many more doors of opportunity, pressing the flesh and running to Vermeer. Another thing that you did, you, you reminded me of Tom Warrant. I remember when I was in Boston and uh, everybody was complaining there were too many dentists in Boston. They got so many dental schools up there. And um, he started doing demographics and realized that everybody in downtown Boston spoke Portuguese and was from Brazil. And so right. he, he actually learned how to speak Portuguese. Yes. And, um, and, then he, and then he started running all of his ads in Portuguese in Boston. Yes. The other dentist yes. didn't, didn't even know what his ads were. And you, yes. you did that. You, you saw the but Asian I, persuasion. I, I, and started so what Cantonese. was happening when I, I, I moved into – you know, Unionville and just on the outskirts of Unionville, with new subdivisions being built and my practice was slowly growing. And then then we had the recession and then boom, every, every you know, people's mortgages were more than the value of the houses and people were disappearing overnight. And then the people that were snapping up these houses were, were all coming basically from Hong Kong, because at the time, Hong Kong was being taken over by China. It was losing its British rule. And the, the citizens of Hong Kong were worried about how China was going to relate taking over Hong Kong. So all of a sudden, we had this huge influx of people from Hong Kong. And most of the people in their 20s and 30s spoke fluent English, fluent Cantonese. But the young kids and the elderly uh, people from Hong Kong you know, spoke broken English, a lot of them, if at all. And so I thought, if I learn, you know, I better adapt to the scenario around me or I'm going to become a dinosaur. So I actually started going to some Cantonese classes just to learn some phrases and to pick up some, some Cantonese. And uh, two little stories. One, the person sitting beside me turned out to be a dentist. He was the uh, about this. He's a, was a year younger than I was. He had grown up in Toronto. He was Asian, but he had distanced himself from the Asian community, and and he he moved into a, a, a or he started his practice in a pretty a pretty um, suburb about an hour away from Toronto. You know, sort of a waspy community, and that's he he didn't want to have anything to do with the Asian community. But as he got older, he realized he couldn't speak Cantonese and he couldn't converse with his, grand, with his grandparents. And so then he was coming back to learn Cantonese so he could converse with his, with his grandparents. Anyways, we ended up becoming extremely close friends and we're, we're still best of friends to this day. And that was over 25 years ago. Um, and then a, a, another story, what happened was I had a, an elderly uh, Cantonese grandmother in my chair, and I thought, okay, I've taken my Cantonese classes. I can, I'm going to try some of my Cantonese on this patient. And luckily, her son, who was about 30 years old, was was in the operatory as well. And she, I wanted to take a look in her mouth, and in Cantonese, just the intonation of the sounds changes the meanings completely, and so. I, w I was telling her in Cantonese, um, this isn't going to hurt a bit. And I have got her reclined in the chair and she just sort of looks at me with a bit of a startled face. And then I repeated the phrase and then her eyes kept getting wider and wider. And at the third time, she was almost trembling. And so I turned around to her son and I said, he had a big smirk on his face. And I said, what does she think I'm saying? And he said, well, you're telling her this is going to be very expensive. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my God! So she ended up being okay. So I, I had to make sure I really was careful with what I was saying in Cantonese. Now we have a staff of about twenty-two, and Toronto is the most um, culturally diverse city on the planet. We have every race, color, religion, you name it, we've got it, and it's a great melting pot. Everybody gets along, and. Our staff reflect that. We speak about five or six languages in the office, and uh, it's uh, it's great, and it reflects our patient population as well. So it's uh, it's it's interesting. 
Um, so the, um, I, I, we, we went way over. Um, I need to uh, um, stop this, but um, we just had 6,000 kids graduate. Um, you um, graduated from uh, right up the street, uh, the, the uh, um, Western University. Uh, yes. So the dean is Dr. Davy Chang, dean of the yes. Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry. Um, yes. um, and, uh, that, is that the only, de that's the only Dean I know who's an MD and not yes. a, um, a dentist. Is and that not a DDS. They combined after I left, they completely combined the medical and dental, uh, school together. So it's under one umbrella now. Is that the only one in, uh, the Western hemisphere that does that? It's the only one I, I'm aware of in Canada. I'm not sure about down in yeah, the states. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. Sure of anybody. So, so that um, that oral health and the um, the oral health continuum that that was the yes. first school, in London, Ontario, to put them back together. Yes. And you know who separated them was Baltimore. And if you go back and you go to the Museum of Dentistry, uh, Baltimore is the first dental. Basically, what it was, it was architects. I mean, that they the the medical school wanted you laying down in the bed and the dentist wanted you right. setting up in a chair. Yes. And that was actually the crux of why they got separated uh, oh. was the bed and the chair. And now a lot of people, the reason I don't like them separated is because the Soviets, they were the ones where um, you were just a doctor and you just became, you specialized in odontology. But what I liked about that is dentistry is all surgery. Whereas, yes. whereas most physician work, family physicians, no surgery. So when you're a dentist and you lose an eye and have 2D or you get disabled or whatever, to switch from a dentist to a family physician or an ear, nose and throat or a derma is just um, unbelievable. But in yes. basically in Russia or the old Soviet bloc, you want to you want to get out of dentistry, you just go back to the med school and do a different rotation. Right, right, and that that was so. I like the more fluidity of the uh, the the worker option. But uh, so let's sure. say you were giving the commencement class for Dr. David yes. Chang um, yes. at the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry in Ontario. Yes. What advice would you give those kids? So, so for the for the dental students just graduating now, I, I would I would say continue with your dental education. You're just getting started. Even think. Even though you think you have a lot of knowledge behind you, um, enjoy dentistry, but also enjoy your relationships outside of dentistry. Stay fit, stay healthy, eat well, and and love your families. And and put everything together. Join some study clubs, and and you'll love dentistry as well. It it becomes part of you. Um, but have a separate life outside of dentistry as well. You know, when I when I come home, even though my wife's a dentist, we try and, you know, as soon as even I do post-op calls at night. And a lot of times I'll sit in, the, in my driveway and do my post-op calls to check on my extraction patients and my endo patients, my implant patients. And then once I, you know, turn that cell phone off, I go through the doors. We try not to talk about dentistry or we'd be doing it 24-7. So, um you know, there's a place for dentistry for you. And then once you close your door into your family, you know, make it your family time. And what, what would you, if you had to describe your dental philosophy in, in just a few words, what would, what would it be? Would it be lean and marry yeah. or what, <laughs> yeah, what, what yeah. would it be? Yeah, lean and lean. And, you could call it lean and marry. I mean, I enjoy practicing. My, my patients know that. My staff know that. I, I come in with a smile on my face no matter what i've got to face every day i'm usually one of the first people through the door we have a huddle in the morning to get get things started and and we go off and you're really the you set the tone for the day if you come in kicking the can and you're not in a good mood well that just reflects right down to the rest of your staff if you're bright you're cheerful and you're carrying the mood and you're setting the tone for the day and you've got to do that day in, day out. So that's that's my message. And what do you think is the root of so much burnout? I mean, there's just it's amazing. Uh, I yeah. just lectured in uh, New York the other day. It's just amazing how many uh, dentists just claim they're burned out. Where, where where do you think that's all coming from? Yeah, I, I, I think they're they're working too many hours, getting caught up in in too much stuff. With, with our system working a six-hour shift, I can work hard for those six hours, then I'm done. 
and then I can do something and the office is still running. I'm not the one taking the emergency calls after I leave the office. Someone else is there. Um, and so I have a life outside dentistry. And so I think that helps me be more productive. And my chair time is my chair time. If I have to do, we're always doing case workups. And I do that. I might come in a couple hours early one one morning a week and do some extra case studies and look at things. And I have time, but I'm not using up my my chair time. So we're productive, but we don't burn ourselves out. Yeah, and that was another thing. Um, so many consultants have told me that. When they see these mean and lean guys from Rick Kirshner who just do like four, six hour shifts, they go in four times and just crush yes. it like a sprint. Yes. And then yes. you go, and then your next client works on Monday through Friday, eight to five, and they never sprint. They're just pacing. And by the yes. time you get a dentist who does Monday through Friday, eight to five and a half day on Saturday, they're just crawling. And, and they, and one of the most interesting things is how they could, um, they could stack these guys by the number of watches. So they go into yes. a hygiene check. The hygienist says, I got a stick on two. And they're like, ah, oh, just watch it. Yeah. Just watch yeah. it. Yeah. And there yeah. are, there are consultants that can do a, a dental review. You know, how you pick your sample is, is as important as your sample size or more. And they, they yeah. back when it was charts, they take a ruler and they put a ruler, pull a chart, ruler, pull a chart. And they do yes. that and they would audit the charts, every chart for, and by the time they got to so many watches, they knew the dentist was clinically depressed. Yes. And that we weren't even dealing I, I, I with data. We were dealing with depression. So yes. if, if, if and, and you look at it, you know, when you go, when you're trying to do the hundred, you run as fast as you can. When I start out uh, on a marathon, I mean, when, when I, I've done three marathons, I usually start holding a beer and walking, you know, I mean, <laughs> you got, you got, got a long six hours ahead of you. So yes, you, you pace yourself. Sure. So the more yes. you run, the sl the longer you go, the slower you go. And, yes. uh, but I just want to tell you, um, man, it's been so fun, uh, reviewing our 32 years of dentistry together. Uh, thank so you so quick. much, uh, for all that you've done for dentistry. And thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your story with the kids today. Yeah. Thank you, Howard. It's been a pleasure. All right. Have a great day.